welcome everyone family friends brothers and sisters all in christ jesus and even everyone who doesn't even know jesus personally welcome to the letter of jude also the epistle of jude or known as the book of jude nonetheless it's the second to the last book in the 66 canonical holy bible that would make it the 65th but not in the sequence of writing but in the sequence of being categorized and put together in the holy book as a whole so we're grateful to have you join us today as we go into the introduction i pray that everyone listening is ready and excited to grow in their faith ready and excited to learn more, to be exhorted, to be strengthened, encouraged, comforted maybe, but most certainly warned, warned of the things ahead, warned of the things that are present, and also taught from things that once were. Let us pray before entering into this one chapter book of Jude, but first the introduction. Let us pray that the Lord would teach us and grow us as we look at the NIV Life Application Bible introduction and the Prophecy Bible. This Bible has many in-depth good teachings, sound teachings within the introductory. So we're going to look at these introductions. We're going to grow together and we're going to take some wise counsel as we look at these scriptures via the Holy Spirit through the children of God. And I'm just excited that we get to do this. I'm, I'm excited that we have the technology to do this. I'm excited that we have the ability to be born again and surrender to an almighty, holy God because of what His Son Jesus did for us. If anybody else is excited and happy because of that, filled with joy because of that, please type an amen in the chat and just continue to hold fast to your faith and know that God, God is able to do all things exceedingly and abundantly beyond what we could hope or imagine. And I pray that's what he's going to do here in this study. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together through such an outlet as this. We thank you for allowing us to join together in any shape, form, or fashion. We thank you for fellowship We thank you for your love poured out through your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit shedding abroad that love within our hearts by faith. We thank you for grace and mercy and love and truth. We thank you for these words. And I pray, Lord, that we would be liberated. We would grow. We would be more free as we experience more truth of your word, as we grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as we grow in the knowledge of your heart for us, Father. And we just know who you are more intimately. Please take away any blind spots. Please take away any hardness of heart or hearing. That we would be receptive and receive what you're saying today. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness, Father. Remove any pride that we can humbly listen to what you're speaking through your word today. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we say thank you and amen. All right. Let's go in now. Thank you for bearing with me for this first three and almost a half minutes uh, prior to the introduction. But if anybody's listened up to this point in this ministry, then you know that I'm a talker. And by God's grace, we see that many brothers and sisters of old were of the same manner. Paul talks so much in it. In fact, in the book of Acts, that he talked all night long that a boy fell asleep and fell out of the window and died. But glory to God, he brought him back to life through prayer, through Paul. But what I'm saying is, Jesus had a lot to say. Look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthews chapter 5, 6, and 7, and portions of Luke. But we can find that those filled with the Spirit of God do have quite a bit to say when the Word is being spoken. But there are times where we should be silent. But in this moment, let us grow. The book of Jude, Introduction. This is out of the NIV Life Application prior to heading into the other translation. To protect from harm, to guard from attack, to repulse enemies. For centuries, rugged defenders have built walls, launched missiles, and waged wars. Expending material and human resources in the battle to save nations and cities. And with total commitment and courageous abandon, individuals have fought for their families. It is a rule of life that we fight for survival, 
defending with all our strength what is most precious to us from every real or imagined attack. God's Word and the gift of eternal life have infinite value and have been entrusted to Christ's faithful followers. There are many people who live in opposition to God and His followers. They twist God's truth, seeking to deceive and destroy the unwary. But God's truth must go forth, carried and defended by those who have committed their lives to God's Son. It is an important task, an awesome responsibility, and a profound privilege to have this commission. This was Jude's message to Christians everywhere. Opposition would come and godless teachers would arise, but Christians should contend for the faith as it is in verse 3. By rejecting all falsehood and immorality from verses 4 through 19, remembering God's mighty acts of rescue and punishment, verses 5 through 11, and the warnings of the apostles, verses 17 through 19. His readers are to build up their own faith through prayer, verse 20, keeping close to Christ, verse 21, helping others in verse 22 and 23, and hating sin in verse 23. Then Jude concludes with a glorious benediction of praise to God, verses 24 and 25. How much do you value God's Word, the fellowship of the church, and obedience to Jesus Christ? There are many false teachers waiting to destroy your Christ-centered life. The credibility of God's Word and the unity of the body of Christ. Read Jude and determine to stand firm in your faith and defend God's truth at all costs. Nothing is more valuable. Amen. That's a powerful one. The purpose of Jude, we find here, is to remind the church of the need for constant vigilance, to keep strong in the faith, and to oppose heresy. Of course, the author is Jude, the brother of Jesus, our Savior and Messiah, and James, Jesus' other brother, whom we have the letter in the epistle of James from. This is written to the Jewish Christians and all believers everywhere, written about A.D. 55. And we find that there's many key verses between the two translations we're going to be looking at here. Um, one is, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. That's verse 3. The setting of this letter is, from the first century on, the church has been threatened by heresy and false teaching. We must always be on our guard. And let's look at some of the blueprints here. One, we find that Jude wrote to motivate Christians everywhere to action. He wanted them to recognize the dangers of false teaching, to protect themselves and other believers, and to win back those who had already been deceived. Jude was writing against godless teachers who were saying that Christians could do as they pleased without fear of God's punishment. While few teach this heresy openly in the church today, Many in the church act as though this were true. This letter contains a warning against living a nominal Christian life. Wow. Let's look at some mega themes. We find the false teachers and apostasy are the two mega themes of the book of Jude. For false teachers, we find the explanation is that Jude warns against false teachers and leaders who reject the lordship of Christ, undermine the faith of others, and lead them astray. These leaders and any who follow them will be punished. This is important because we must staunchly defend Christian truth. Make sure that you avoid leaders and teachers who distort the Bible to suit their own purposes. Genuine servants of God will faithfully portray Christ in their words and conduct. And for apostasy, we find the explanation being Jude also warns against this apostasy, turning away from Christ. We are to remember that God punishes rebellion against Him. We must be careful not to drift away from a faithful commitment to Christ. And this is important because those who do not seek to know the truth in God's Word are susceptible to apostasy. Christians must guard against any false teachings that would distract them from the truth preached by the apostles and written in God's word. Amen. 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 This is absolutely beautiful. This is a message that needs to be repeated time and time and time and time again. We can never get enough of God's word. And this message of the book of Jude 
of heresy and apostasy, false teaching, of guarding our hearts in essence, of standing firm and remaining steadfast in our faith, is one of the most important messages that we could possibly have from Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between. This is the message to watch out for the lies of the enemy, to watch out for deception, to guard ourselves, to to live righteously, to walk in the way of God by knowing the way of God. Let's repeat that, to walk in the way of God by knowing the way of God. Now, who's the way of God? Jesus. He's the truth, he's the way, and he's the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. That's John 14, 6. But he's the living word of God. And he also reveals to us, Jesus, when he's teaching, that the only way to know him and his revelation of who he is, is through the written word of God. So the written word points us to the living word, which is the Son of God. And the Son of God reveals and points us to the Father God. And also, through the Son comes the Holy Spirit. may sound like a mystery. It is a great mystery. But those who are born of the Spirit, those who are born again, can receive these truths today. And that's why this letter is written to us from Jude, Jesus' brother. We need this message now more than ever, just as much as they needed it when it was written, and just as much as we'll need it in the last second. We need it now. Now, in the New King James Prophecy Bible introduction, let's get deeper into the book of Jude, if we shall. The book of Jude as a whole, fight, contend, do battle, When apostasy arises, when false teachers emerge, when the truth of God is attacked, it is time to fight for the faith. Only believers who are spiritually in shape can answer the summons. At the beginning of his letter, Jude focuses on the believers' common salvation, but then feels compelled to challenge them to contend for the faith. The danger is real. False teachers have crept into the church, turning God's grace into unbounded license to do as they please. Jude reminds such men of God's past dealings with unbelieving Israel, disobedient angels, and wicked Sodom and Gomorrah. In the face of such danger, Christians should not be caught off guard. The challenge is great, but so is the God who is able to keep them from stumbling. The Greek title, Ioda, which means of Jude, comes from the name Iodas, which appears in verse 1. This name, which can be translated Jude or Judas, was popular in the first century because of Judas Maccabeus, which who died in the year 160 BC. He was a leader of the Jewish resistance against Syria during the Maccabean revolt. And also to add into that, that's where you get the book of Maccabees broken into two parts, the first Maccabees and second Maccabees. That was taken out of the canon. And bear with me, if you will, receive it if you shall, but it is in the Apocrypha, which was in the original 1611 KJV, King James Bible, but it was removed. So if you ever want to get into some extracurricular, biblical, theological, deep studies and teaching with prayer, of course, with even fasting and seeking the Lord's face, of course, don't ever go without prayer and trust in the Lord and bring everything back to this word, the word of God, and make sure it adds up. So... Divide the word of truth and trust the Lord. But Maccabee has a series, the series of scriptures written on him. First Maccabees, second Maccabees, which ties directly in with Judas Maccabeus, the one who stood up for God and the Jewish people against the Syrians. So that's something to do a good personal study on. The author of Jude. In spite of its limited subject matter and size, Jude was accepted as authentic and quoted by early church fathers. There may be some older allusions, but undisputed references to this epistle appear in the last quarter of the second century. It was included in the Muratorian canon in A.D. 170 and accepted as part of scripture by early leaders such as Tertullian and Origen. Nevertheless, doubts arose concerning the place of Jude in the canon because of its use of the Apocrypha. It was a disputed book in some parts of the church but it eventually won universal recognition. And that's why I said what I said by mentioning Maccabees, which is in the Apocrypha. Many condemn that as witchcraft. To you, be your own measure. But let me not judge you, and let you not judge me, and let us not judge others, but let us hold fast to the truth which is in God's word.
Amen. In the name of Jesus, let it be. Amen. The author identifies himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. That's verse 1. This designation combined with the reference in verse 17 to the apostles makes it unlikely that this is the apostle Jude, called Judas the son of James, in Luke 6.16 6, and in Acts 1.13. This leaves the traditional view that Jude was one of the Lord's brothers called Judas in Matthew 13, verse 55, and Mark 6, verse 3. See the author of James for further details. We can look into that. His older brother James, which is, notes his position on the two lists, was the famous leader of the Jerusalem church in Acts 15, verses 13 to 21, and author of the epistle that bears his name, the epistle, the letter of James. Like his brothers, Jude did not believe in Jesus before the resurrection. That's written in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9, and Acts chapter 1, verse 14. The only other biblical allusion to him is in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5, where it is recorded that the brothers of the Lord took their wives along on their missionary journeys. The Judas of Acts 15, 22, and 32 may be another reference to him. Extra biblical tradition adds nothing to our limited knowledge of Jude. The time of Jude. Jude's general address does not mark out any particular circle of readers, and there are no geographical restrictions. Nevertheless, he probably had in mind a specific region that was being troubled by false teachers. There was not enough information in the epistle to settle the question of whether his readers were predominantly Jewish or Gentile Christians. There is probably a mixture of both. In any case, the progress of the faith in their region was threatened by a number of apostates who rejected Christ in practice and principle. These proud libertines were especially dangerous because of their deceptive flattery in verse 16 and infiltration of Christian meetings in verse 12. They perverted the grace of God in verse 4 and caused divisions in the church in verse 19. Jude's description of these heretics is reminiscent of that found in 2 Peter and leads to the issue of the relationship between the two epistles, the authorship of Second Peter and the authorship of, uh, authorship of Jude, uh, declares that they were indeed working together in the faith. The strong similarity between similarity between Second Peter two one through three four and Jude four through eighteen can hardly be coincidental, but the equal obvious differences rule out the possibility that one is a mere copy of the other. It is also doubtful that both authors independently drew from an unknown third source. So the two remaining options are that Peter used Jude or Jude used Peter. Both views have their advocates and a number of arguments have been raised in support of either side. But two arguments for the priority of 2 Peter are so strong that they tip the scales in favor of this position. One, a comparison paints the future rise of apostate Sorry, one, a comparison of the two books shows that 2 Peter anticipates the future rise of apostate teachers, 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2 and 3, verse 3. While Jude records the historical fulfillment of Peter's words, Jude verses 4, 11, 12, 17, and 18. Secondly, Jude directly quotes 2 Peter 3, 3 and acknowledges it as a quotation from the apostles. Also, we can recite 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Because of the silence of the New Testament and tradition concerning Jude's later years, we cannot know where this epistle was written, nor is there any way to be certain of its date. Assuming the priority of 2 Peter from A.D. 64 to 66, the probable range is A.D. 66 through 80. Jude's silence concerning the destruction of Jerusalem does not prove that he wrote this letter before A.D. 70. The Christ of Jude in contrast to those who stand condemned by their licentiousness, sorry, licentiousness and denial of Christ in verse 4, the believer is preserved in Jesus Christ from verse 1. Jude tells his readers to keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life in verse 21. But at the same time, the Lord is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy in verse 24. The keys to Jude, the key word is contend for the faith. This epistle is intensely concerned with the threat of heretical teachers in the church and the believer's proper response to that threat. The contents reveal two major purposes. First, to condemn the practices of the ungodly libertines who were infesting the churches and corrupting believers. 
and second, to counsel the readers to stand firm, grow in their faith, and contend for the truth. Jude says little about the actual doctrines of these raging waves of the sea, but they may have held to an antinomian, sorry, antinomian version of Gnosticism. The readers are encouraged to read out to those, reach out to those who have been misled by these men. The key verse is Jude verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Verse 3. The survey of Jude as a whole states, A surprisingly large number of the Pauline and non-Pauline epistles confront the problem of false teachers, and almost all of them allude to it. But Jude goes beyond all other New Testament epistles in its relentless and passionate denunciation of the apostate teachers who have crept in unnoticed. With the exception of its salutation in verses 1 and 2 and doxology in the last two verses, 24 and 25, the entire epistle revolves around this alarming problem. Combining the theme of 2 Peter with the style of James, Jude is potent in spite of its brevity, its shortness. This urgent letter has four major sections, purpose of Jude, verses 1 through 4, description of false teachers, verses 5 through 16, defense against false teachers, verses 17 through 23, and of course the doxology of Jude being verses 24 and 25. The purpose of Jude from verses 1 through 4 is that Jude addresses his letter to believers who are called sanctified and preserved and wishes for them the threefold blessing of mercy, peace, and love. Grim news about the encroachment of false teachers in the churches has impelled Jude to put aside his con commentary on salvation to write this timely word of rebuke and warning. In view of apostates who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny Christ, it is crucial that believers contend earnestly for the faith. In the description of the false teachers, Jude begins his extended expose of the apostate teachers by illustrating their ultimate doom with three examples of divine judgment from the Pentateuch. Like unreasoning animals, these apostates are ruled by the things they revile, and they are destroyed by the things they practice. Even the archangel Michael is more careful in his dealings with superhuman powers than are these arrogant men. He compares these men to three spiritually rebellious men from Genesis, Cain and Numbers, Balaam and Korah, who incurred the condemnation of God in verse 11. Verses 12 and 13 succinctly summarize their character with five highly descriptive metaphors taken from nature. After affirming the judgment of God upon such ungodly men with a quote from the non-canonical book of Enoch, Jude catalogs some of their practices. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. And the defense against the false teachers. This letter has been exposing apostate teachers but now Jude directly addresses his readers. But you, beloved, remember. He reminds them of the apostolic warning that such men would come and encourages them to protect themselves against the onslaught of apostasy. The readers must become mature in their own faith so that they will be able to rescue those who are enticed or already ensnared by error. And for the doxology of Jude, Jude closes with one of the greatest doxologies in the Bible. It emphasizes the power of Christ to keep those who trust in him from being overthrown by error. I know it's a lot to chew on. It's a lot to take in. There's a lot to process there. And we're going to process a lot more of it and digest it by God's grace as we read the book of Jude, the letter of Jude in its whole, which is one chapter, 25 verses. But there's a lot to take in. So let us be prepared. Let us receive the warning. Let us receive the instruction. Let us be corrected, but also be encouraged and reminded as we go forth. And I thank you for bearing with me and enjoying, hopefully enjoying, this introduction to the letter of Jude. Blessings from the Most High God and peace be unto you and within you as you fix your eyes on Him in the name of Christ Jesus His Son and by the power of His Holy Spirit. We'll see you in the next portion of this letter. Lord willing, until then. Amen.